It's time for another episode of the We Society podcast. I'm Will Hutton, an economist and journalist. But more importantly, I'm the president of the Academy of Social Sciences, who bring you this podcast. Social science is everywhere. It's the lifeblood of our society. And in this podcast, we interview some of the country's top social scientists to hear how their ideas are shaping the way we live. We might live on an island here in the UK, but we are a we, an interconnected society. And we need the new ideas and innovation brought to you by social science that build on that interconnectedness for the better. I hope you enjoy the We Society podcast. In Britain, your chances of being stopped and searched are three times higher if you're black than if you're white. On the other hand, research in the United States shows that a white high school dropout is about 15 times more likely to be in prison than a black college graduate. So is it class or race that means you are more likely to be stopped and searched? To make matters more complicated, even if class is the driver, maybe it's racism that traps so many people of colour in the working class. In the wake of the Casey Review into the Metropolitan Police with its charge that the force is institutionally racist, any complacency about race and racism is impossible. It's not an issue only acute in the United States. It's been the midwife to the rise of identity politics, Black Lives Matter, for example, and campaigns for racial justice, but also the rise of identity politics on the right, the forgotten, left-behind, white working class. What's going on and why are perhaps the most important issues of today. With me today is Kenan Malik, a fellow Observer columnist, a BBC Radio 4 regular and an author whose multitude of books covers race, philosophy and multiculturalism. In his latest book, Not So Black and White, something of a masterwork in my view, he delves into the idea that identity politics, even when well-meaning and in the interests of furthering a repressed group's cause, can in fact prop up racism. It's not race that causes racism, he argues, rather racism that leads to race, the thinking in racial categories. He joins us on the We Society this week. Welcome, Kenan. It's a privilege to have you here. It's good to be here. Thank you, Will. When you got the invitation to join me on this We Society podcast, (laughs) what are you thinking? We Society? What's your first thoughts that go through your mind when you hear me this kind of invitation and this category, this, this, this name. From one perspective, all societies are we societies. Societies are uh, collectives of people. I think the issue, though, is how we define the we. What do we belong to? Who belongs? To whom should I give my solidarity? And those are the questions that run through my work and run through my book, because there are different ways of thinking of belonging or community or solidarity. We can think of a nation, for instance, in ethnic terms, or we can think of it as some kind of political contract. Similarly with solidarity, um, we can think about solidarity. To whom do I have uh, social affinity in terms of race or gender or sexuality or nation? Or we can think of it in terms of values and beliefs. That is, I I owe my solidarity to those who have the same values and beliefs as I do. That I want to create a a, a common group, a a commonality based not on my ethnicity or my culture or my faith, but on the kinds of societies that we want. And it seems to me that both a racial view of the world, an identitarian view of the world, all both have a sense of a we. They all, they, they all yeah. promote a notion yeah. of a we society. Yeah. But it is a we society to which I'm hostile because the notion of the we is something that is um, uh, that, that seems to me really problematic. Um, for me, solidarity means solidarity with those who are denied their rights and solidarity with those who think and argue for the kind of society that I want to, to live in. It doesn't matter to me whether you know, the person with, to whom I'm standing on a picket line or arguing against the illegal immigration bill is 
of the same skin colour as me or the same class as me or the same uh, culture as me. It does matter that they think the same as I do about strikes or about uh, migration and so on. So it's, it's the distinction between we created, formulated in identitarian or racial terms and we formulated in political terms. That's at the heart of this book, in fact. I mean, I think that's it's straight. If you go through it, that's kind of, uh, in most of your chapters, it's kind of stream, streaming through it. I'm fascinated by this um, kind of line of yours. Um, race did not give birth to racism. Racism gave birth to race. Just to unpack that, because for people coming to this cold, they'll be thinking, what? You're, you're right. Most people imagine racism occurs when races collide. That is, when peoples of one race discriminate against peoples of another race. In fact, both historically and conceptually, you kind of turn that on its head. As you say, race didn't give rise to racism. Racism gave rise to race. The ancestors of today's African Americans were not enslaved because they were black, but they became defined as black and as inferior as a, as a way of justifying their enslavement. And if you go back historically, race, uh, as we know it, is a modern concept. But that's not to say that pr in the pre-modern world, uh, people didn't categorise different groups of people, that didn't discriminate against different groups of people. One of the interesting... People. I mean, I have to say, I thought it was... I mean, I've, I'm working on a book of my own, and I've been very struck at how, in the second half of the 19th century the middle-class British kind of were recoiled from the poor in their midst. I mean, they just didn't recognise them. I mean, they thought they came from a different race. And you pick that up in your book, actually, quite interestingly. I mean, just, you know, the way in which even some liberal social reformers actually thought, well, the way we're going to have to kind of deal with the poor is kind of um, breed them out. You know, the, the, the eugenics movement, and uh, which even people like George Bernard Shaw kind of were adherents of in the early 1900s. It's extraordinary. I mean, so that you're, that, that's white on white, but actually that's a kind of a white middle class ascribing racial characteristics to their own class, or their, own, their own race, I should say. Indeed, but, but that's, it's not their own race as they saw it. Right. Yes, exactly. That, that, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the point is the way we understand what whiteness is, it's very different from the way... 19th century thinkers saw whiteness and race. And th this goes back to this, the issue of the relationship between race and racism. Race is a modern concept. Race is a post-enlightenment concept because it is only in societies that have accepted the idea of equality and of a common humanity that the idea of racial inequality and uh, distinct racial groups within society make sense because those have to be justified. Yeah. So something like the French Declaration of Rights of Man, the American Declaration of Independence and so on, all those insisted that humans are equal, um, that equality is a fundamental basis of society. But in social practice, societies were anything but equal. You had... Uh, inequalities, class inequalities that you've just been talking about. You had colonialism, you had uh, enslavement. S enslavement, I mean, famously, and the founding fathers of the American Republic were slave owners. Yeah. Indeed. In the pre-modern world, that wouldn't have made any difference because that's, that was part of the way the world was. That was seen as, as natural and, 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 and inevitable. But in societies that insisted on the importance of equality and of a common humanity, then there had to be some kind of justification, some kind of explanation for that. And race was that explanation because certain groups came to be seen as uh, naturally inferior and therefore not worthy of liberty and equality. That's the way race arises. And that's why, um, going back to your original question, Race doesn't give rise to racism. Racism, the, 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 the presence of inequality, the social practice of inequality, gives rise to race as an explanation for that inequality yeah, yeah, in societies yeah, that yeah. have proclaimed themselves to be equal. And so on, on your point about the poor, one of the ways in which 19th century thinking about race is so different from contemporary thinking about race um, that we often can't uh, imagine it is that 
as you say, that, that the 19th century thinkers saw the working class, the middle class 19th century thinkers saw the working class as being anthropologically and biologically distinct in the same way as many now see blacks and whites yeah. as anthropologically and biologically distinct. It wasn't a metaphor they used. They actually believed that these were distinct races. Um, and so much of 19th century discussion, so much of 19th century sociology is about how class differences are really racial differences. A quick spool forward to today. I mean, where do you sit in this kind of debate about the degree to which Britain should consider itself to be a racist society? I mean, there's, on the one hand, you have people pointing to the fact we have a, a practicing Hindu as our prime minister and a, a Muslim as first minister of Scotland. And there's a joke, you know, that it will be, it'll be those two that preside over the partition of Britain, <laughs> you know, after the partition of India all those years ago. I mean, so there's that, you know. And on the other hand, you know, you have the Casey report on the Metropolitan Police where it's very profound. And I, I just wonder where, I mean, you, you've thought about this, you observe it. I mean, you're a man of colour yourself. I mean, where do you sit on this? To, and, and does it matter uh, in a sense? I mean, should I, should I even be t- asking you the question? Sure, it matters hugely, I think, um, because it matters how we we understand what Britain is and what race and racism is. Um, If we step back a bit, the the Britain I grew up in was very different from the Britain of today. I grew up in a Britain uh, in which racism was visceral, in your face. It was vicious. um, Firebombing, stabbings, murders, these were common routine events. Um, back and part in the of your life, and, 80s. Uh, and part of your early uh, life as a student and in your early twenties, was fighting back, wasn't it? I mean, really. Yeah, I, 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 my my introduction, in a sense, to to politics in, in my late teens was organising street patrols to protect Asian families from racial attacks. I mean, it was that vicious and, and visceral, and, and much of that has disappeared. Thankfully, disappeared. Britain we live in now is a very different kind of place. Um, it's not that racism has disappeared. But the form of racism has changed completely, and, and we've made huge progress um, in that. Intermarriage, so, intermarriage is phenomenally high compared with other countries. I, I'm struck- indeed, yeah. I mean, if, if you go back again to, to look at public attitudes in the 1980s, um, the British social attitudes, the, it began in the 1980s, and, and its initial survey showed the enormous hostility of white Britons to intermarriage, uh, to living in the same street as, as those of a different race or ethnicity and so on. Again, much of that has disappeared. But the reading the Casey report, what struck me was, this is a throwback to the 80s, that within the Metropolitan Police, you had the attitudes and practices that, you know, that I, I, I remember from, from growing up. So um, we, we need to kind of look at it on both sides of it, how much progress we've made, but also that something like the Casey report um, reveals um, that there are aspects of, of, of our life where that progress hasn't been made. It's also, I mean, you, you're mentioning the fact that the UK and Scotland are run by two men who are both of South Asian descent. What's also interesting about those two is that they're both privately educated. Yeah, that's class. And we I, I, we, yeah, we yeah, talk yeah. about <laughs> that, we, and, and the fact that we kind of concentrate on one aspect of their commonality, but almost ignore the other aspect. Yeah. I think says a lot about the way we think about diversity. That we, we kind of see diversity in racial or ethnic terms, but we often don't see it when it comes to questions of class. And I think that's equally important. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is very striking that they're both privately educated. And they've, they've acquired, uh, in both cases, kind of tonally, the kind of the bearing and, and, and speak with, I mean, particularly Rishi Sunak, you know, the language of an educated kind of a member of the, <laughs> of the British upper middle class sure. as they have spoken for the last 350 years. Sure. Know. So in, in a sense, they, they show both the progress that has been made in that uh, somebody of South Asian descent can be reach the highest office in the land. But they also show how little progress we've made um, in terms of the way that the working class are still at the margins of power and, and, and of politics. If I give you just 30 seconds to kind of, you know, spell out to our listeners what you consider the problem to be and why we should burn with indignation about it. Well, 
the, the issue that actually that I burn with indignation about is is our attitudes to migration and our attitudes to asylum. If, if, if you want an issue that I really burn about, because um, the idea that you could have um, mass deportation of people who come to this country arbitrarily simply because they have the wrong papers to a country they have never been to and don't want to go to, ten years ago. Very, very few people would, would, would have thought that as moral or acceptable, apart from those on the fringes of politics on the far right. Now it's become a, a mainstream view. So, and it seems to me that that's a, a, a very important aspect of the way the moral dial has shifted. But if you talk about class, I think it is... The, the, the way we talk about class seems to me to, to undermine the basis of any kind of class solidarity. What I mean is this, we think about minorities as belonging almost to classless communities. That We talk about the black community or, or, or the Muslim community and so on. And class becomes something that's applied simply to, the, or mainly to the white population. So we talk about the white working class. But when we talk about the white working class, we're not really referring to their class position. We're referring much more to their whiteness, that their problems seem to arise from their whiteness rather than from, from being working class. So we kind of, in both senses, we, we eliminate class. We, we expunge class from our so, discussion of class. So when you talk about the, the left behind white working class, you're saying lose the word white. Well, there is, I mean, sociologically, we can say there are sections of the population. Um, I don't like the term left behind because it kind of, it's a kind of pejorative term on, on people uh, as if they, they haven't moved with the rest, the rest of us into the future. Uh, there are sections of, of the working class, the old towns in, 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 the, in the northeast, for instance, um, the old manufacturing and mining towns and so on, where um, because of both the shift in the nature of the British economy and the way we treat people who are poor, unemployed, working class have become marginalised. And because the the parties and organisations that used to represent them, the Labour Party, trade unions, the Labour Party has moved away from um, representing, like most social democratic parties in Europe, have moved, moved away from its traditional working class constituencies, trade unions have lost much of their power and, and influence. And so they have been marginalised. But so have um, working class people who are not white, because the majority of most minorities in this country are working class. Um, and most of them, for, for not just in the last 20 or 30 years, but, but throughout their existence in this country, have worked on the margins of the economy have often worked in jobs that became lost even quicker than the manufacturing jobs like steel and shipbuilding, and whose ability to influence politics has been even less uh, than that of um, what we now call the white working class. So we shouldn't see this as a racial issue. We should see it as a class issue. And the way we understand class has been become so forced through the lens of culture or race or ethnicity that we almost lose sense of what class is and what why it matters. So you're, in a, in a sense, kind of um, saying, let's get back to the politics of um, the 1940s and 50s and 60s when we discussed this and the recent kind of way in which politics opened up, identity politics trumps everything. It's a, it's a, it's a road that hasn't helpful. I mean, if you're on the liberal left, it's unhelpful, but it's, not, it's unhelpful well, generally, actually, because it's just these are kind of artificial categories. Well, I'd say two things about that. The first is that we've always had identitarian politics or identitarian strands within anti-racist uh, working class movements. That, that, they've always been there. So within anti-racist movements, for instance, um, the Back to Africa movements from in, in the 19th century, the um, Garveyism, Negritude, Pan-Africanism, th those have always been there. But they, they were relatively marginal. Um, there were moments at which... Uh, they became important, but they were relatively marginal. It's, but over the past 13, 40 years, they have become the dominant feature of our um, anti-racist and of our class politics. And that's because any kind of broader uh, universalist 
ar- arguments, any kind of broad universalist politics. You say universalist. That, just, I, maybe, I'm, but, yeah. what, what I'm, but I mean, a, any politics that says uh, my solidarity is with those who who don't necessarily look like me or have my skin colour or my culture or my faith, but my solidarity is with those who, one, are denied their rights and basic dignities, and two, who have my view about what kind of society we want to move into. That, that just goes back to our original discussion of what a we society is yeah. and what we what the we-ness means. So can I, can I just... I mean, are you for or against Black Lives Matter? And one wearing one hat, it's a form of identity politics that actually you think is kind of going astray. On the other hand, it's an affirmation of a protest and a and a desire to correct injustice that you must be for. So where do you sit on Black Lives Matter then? Well, I, th- I, th- I think are you for or against um, is part of the problem. Posing the question in that fashion is part of the problem. Um, the problem, I think, with an organisation like Black Lives Matter is that it conflates the necessity to fight racism with the necessity to build racial solidarity. They're two different things. And the second actually makes the first more difficult. And what is the answer to all this? I mean, in your book, you talk about, you finish off by talking about, well, I mean, philosophically, um, an egalitarian universalism, which is a kind of mouthful. But I mean, I'm, you might like to kind of decode that for our listeners, but also so, a social movements that would carry that philosophy. I and mean, that's your twin strategy. Uh, can I unpack it and tell us what, how, you, how you would see a response? Sure. We need to think about uh, what it is that we're fighting against. When we fight against racism, say, are we fighting against the idea that, that there aren't sufficient black managers or sufficient black people in the elite? Or are we fighting for the rights of ordinary black people to be treated the same as, as everyone else? Because they're actually two different things. One of the problems we've had in recent years is that equality has become translated as diversity, that somehow having a more diverse society gives us a more equal society. It doesn't. We're living in a more diverse society, but also a more unequal society. Yep, yep. And it's um, Walter Ben Michaels, the, the, the American writer, he makes the point that a diverse elite is nevertheless still the elite. And so we need to be clear about what we're fighting for. Secondly, that we build those kinds of movements through struggle, through struggle um, for good housing, for decent wages, for proper conditions, and so on. And we do so because the people who are affected by poor housing or uh, stagnating wages or poor conditions at work aren't racially defined. They are defined by the fact that they are poor and working class. And that fighting for uh, proper wages for all is fighting against racism because it is... Precisely because the... Um, so are you an old-fashioned socialist, really? I mean, is that really who you are? I, I, I don't... I, I, uh, you I, know, that capital, that capital and relations to capital are fundamental, that actually uh, that's det- uh, that we should remind ourselves about people's... Are you a wage earner or, are you, or, do, you get, or do you get profits, dividends and rents? I mean, that's... Uh, that, that, yeah, I, I agree with all that, except that, that I don't think one of the problems with the old left, as it were was its failure to understand racism and its failure to to tackle racism. I'm not saying we shouldn't tackle racism. I'm saying that there are different ways of tackling racism and that um, if we don't bring class into the question of how we tackle racism, then we betray black people, uh, minorities, uh, who are at the bottom of society. Um, Not bringing class into that equation it's very helpful for middle class minorities. It's not very helpful for minorities um, who are working class, who are poor, um, and who need our solidarity in, in in a broader sense. Well, how does social science fit into your kind of way of looking at the world? I mean, here we are. It's the social science podcast. Uh, I'm president of the Academy of Social Sciences. What light does it throw on the kinds of issues you've been discussing over the last half an hour? Well, I think precisely that we should think about the social roots 
of the problems we face. One of the consequences of the loss of power, the economic and social power of, of the working class over the past 30, 40 years, has been that social problems have come not to be seen in economic and social terms, but more in cultural terms or identitarian terms. That um, We talked earlier about the white working class, the problems that faced by, in the inverted commas, the white working class is because they're white rather than because they are working class. And that the problems that the white working class face are the same problems that the working class uh, who are black or Muslim or, or um, any other minority also face. So when you see, I mean, uh, um, we live in an age of identitarian politics. I mean, that is the way it's framed. I mean, the right go after the left and the left to kind of defend themselves by saying these are all minority groups that deserve to have a voice. I mean, you're saying, hold on, guys, uh, let's talk class. That's because that's really what we need to talk about. And we need to talk about social movements that bring that back on the table. Is that the core of your position? One of the arguments made is that identity politics is simply about defending people against racism or homophobia or women's discrimination, or misogyny, um, and so on. That these are ways of, of defending people whose rights have been denied. I reject that because all my life I have fought against racism and, and homophobia and, and, and misogyny. The real debate we're having is not, should we fight against racism or homophobia and misogyny? It, it is about how we fight against. Yeah. It's easy to caricature the argument as, as, as saying we shouldn't fight against these things. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that so long as we think only in terms of our narrow identities, so long as we, we see that as the, the basis of our, our politics, then we will never be able to overcome the problems of uh, racism or, or homophobia or misogyny or, or the uh, discrimination against trans people, for instance. I was drawn into politics because of my experience of racism. So those experiences are very important. But they're, they're, they're only the starting point. They're not the end point. It's politics that made me see beyond racism, beyond the injustices done to me, that what matters is not someone's skin colour or their, or, or their ethnicity or, or, or their sexuality or, or their gender or their culture, but what they stand for, what they believe. And again, we come back to this question of how do we define the weeness of a we society? How do we define solidarity. And it seems crucial to me that we define solidarity not in identitarian terms, but in political terms. What matters in, when it comes to solidarity is both um, political inequalities and the fact that we make common cause with those who believe the same as we do, or the same as I do, not who looks like me, or has the same culture as me, or has the same background as me. That, I think, to me, is a crucial distinction. Kenan, Kenan Malak, thank you so much. It's been a very illuminating 30, 40 minutes. Uh, and, you know, we ended where we began with you insisting that it's shared belief that counts most. And you kind of made us think harder, too, about the We Society. Uh, and we came up with the name of the We Society because we thought it was a kind of quite neat way of capturing what social science was about, that actually the weeness is about social structures and how they are so important in actually determining life chances and, and, and all the rest. What you've reminded us is that there's other ways which you can define weeness in racial terms and that actually that is also a weeness. It has to be, uh, that can be disastrous. And I think that was a very helpful correction because that's very much not how we think about the we society but i mean uh, uh, along the way you've um, showed us how the you know the white working class and the white middle class even in the 19th century the way in which uh, the white middle class thought about their their own their own white working class was actually curiously in a kind of racial category and how pernicious it all is and how important it is to get back to that shared belief thank you so much thank you it's been a pleasure being here Thank you so much for joining in the conversation. The We Society is brought to you by the Academy of Social Sciences, acss.org.uk. I'm Will Hutton, the producer is Emily Finch, and it's a Whistledown production. 
If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast, leave a comment, share with your colleagues and friends, or send us an email and tell us what we should be asking and who we should talk to.